recently. What do you mean he's wearing a fake? No way, that's madness. Aye, because it's not what you know, it's who you know. A few of the boys that I know are keeping them in safes in case they get bumped. I don't know, something about the markets are crashing and the UK clamping down on Rolex. No, I've not seen that. I've not seen that podcast. Send the link, William Reed. Send the link, mate. Right, spot on. Cheers. This is my favourite watch. This is my favourite Rolex. Um, so it's a yellow gold 18 karat day date with a silver Roman dial. It's been my favourite Rolex forever. I just always go back to it as if there was one Rolex I had to buy and keep for myself, it'd be this one. Um, I always sell it, I end up buying it back just to have it to wear, but it's definitely my favourite. Um, I just feel like the bracelet is just, you can wear it with like jeans, you can wear it with a suit, you can wear it with a tracksuit, like it's all, it's all the same, but, but that's my favourite watch. This is just some stuff I grabbed from the safe just to come down, um, just to try and give you like a bit of an idea of the sort of stuff we've got, the sort of different range, so stuff on the table will range from like six grand, you've got you've got a date just at the back, look, date just 36 with a silver diamond dial, it's like 6,000, um, all the way up to sort of 40,000 for the yellow gold, and uh, the watch I've got on is like 85,000, so um, yeah, good spread, we like to sort of keep a lot of different levels in, in stock, you just never know what a customer's going to want, and it's, and it's really good to show a customer a few different, a good selection of stuff uh, when they come to buy stuff for you. So, so this is an OP, so Oyster Perpetual 41 Tiffany dial. So these have been out for a couple of years, just recently got discontinued. Um, and they were quite big in the Asian market when they first came out. So I think the retail is like four or nine or something. Um, they were selling for sort of 10, 11, 12 grand when they sort of first came out. Uh, there was a big release from Patek last year who'd done a collaboration with Tiffany. Um, and they released a 5711 with the Tiffany blue dial. Um, I think about 150 watches roughly. Um, and retail on them is about 27,000. I think the first one sold at auction for just shy of $6 million. So when that got released, I thought, looking forward, you know, what, what watches is that gonna bring up with it? And the only other watch in the market that had the same color dial, the Tiffany blue is, is is the OP41, so it come in, comes in 41, um, 31 and 36. So I thought, take a bit of a risk and we'll buy some and just sort of see where the market goes. So we bought five, would have been six if a dealer didn't let me down, but um, we bought five tail end of last year and the 5711 got released, market went up a little bit, then they got discontinued just in March, and they boomed from 12 grand to, you've seen them listed for like 50 overnight. So only been in production for two years, um, will be like one for the future, mega, mega collectible. And um, there's not many out there. A lot of ADs will tell you that they're harder to get than Daytonas. So obviously the last year's been, been exponential in terms of prices and growth and demand in the market. Um, I think you'll find that so many big players now have so much invested in watches that the market's definitely not going to crash like everyone claims it is. What's happened is a slight correction, which if, if you've been watching any of my lives or whatever, I've been saying that's going to happen for months. Um, any market in any sector is always going to come down when it's been growing exponentially for eight, nine, ten months. So a slight correction is actually healthy for the market. Um, it's going to bring stuff down to really what the true value is and not what the value is just dependent on the, the really, really limited supply and the crazy demand. So I feel like the watch market is going to continue to grow, but just not as quickly as it has been for the last 12 months. So I got my start in watches. My parents bought me a watch for my birthday. Um, it sounds stupid, but I didn't really like it. I didn't love it. Um, it was a steel and gold Daytona, but I had a grey dial. Just wasn't really my thing so I kept it for a bit and then managed to sell it about six seven months later to try and get something else and made a bit of money on it so I made like 700 quid on it 
and I'd only had it for six months. So kind of thought might be something here that we could start earning some more money from. Um, by that time, I'd just left uni and I was working in an engineering firm and hated it. So it was just like any escape from that, basically. Um, and and yeah, that's that's how it started and just sort of snowballed from there. Sounds easy, but I never sold a watch like properly once I'd set the company up for about eight months. It changes every day, to be honest. Like some, some weeks you could have like a crazy busy week. So you could be out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, and then other weeks, like you might not do anything Monday, Tuesday. You might have some travel on Wednesday. It just differs. Like when we first set up the business, sorry, I don't know why I say we, but when I first set up the business, um, it was based in Scotland. So all the travel was like Glasgow, Edinburgh, um, mostly in Glasgow. Obviously now that the business is a bit bigger and we've sort of branched out more down south, we do quite a lot in Manchester, we do loads in Newcastle, we do loads and loads in London. So travel's like quite a big part of it. So I'm away like all the time. So I was away last week, I was in Copenhagen the week before. Um, I've got London on Wednesday, I've got Manchester on Thursday. Um, so yeah, it just depends. It just, it, it changes every week. Some weeks you're quite quiet, some weeks you're quite busy. Identifying trends is quite tricky. Um, Cause there's so much smoke online about watches nowadays that people are just so involved in what they read online and then that then starts a trend rather than it actually being like a trend of investment if that makes sense so if you think about like John Mayer he's like a famous collector so he done a an article with Hodinkee which is like a big watch blog and um, that would have been like probably a couple of years ago now and he done an article talking about what he thinks is, will be like the next big pieces for Rolex so he mentioned like the white gold Daytona with the blue dial and he mentioned like specifically the yellow gold Daytona with the green dial. So when they first come out 2017, they were sort of selling for, I mean, I sold a few to some customers like 20, 21,000, 22,000, you know, and then they reached um, probably at their peak last year, you're talking like 115, 120. Um, and they sort of doubled or trebled in value pretty much two weeks after he'd done that article. So a lot of watch trends are, are really based on big news in the watch industry and one person can can change a lot in terms of investment value for, for one piece. So it's difficult to predict a trend for a watch because you just never know what someone's going to say about it. And if someone notable in the industry says something that they think is is, is going to happen with a certain watch or they, they really like the watch or they think it's going to get discontinued, for example, then obviously like that watch can blow up. But but yeah, it's, it's hard to predict trends. It's like the same thing with People always say to me, oh, you must get everything from, from the, like, at retail from like your AD or whatever. I'm like, I've honestly never bought one watch at retail in the eight and a half years or nine years I've been doing this. So um, people like to feel like you know more than they do. But in reality, it's, you don't actually know any more. I know more about watches and selling watches and buying watches, but everyone knows the same amount about a trend in a watch or no one knows when a watch is going to get discontinued until the day it gets discontinued. So all the smoke and mirrors before it about... Is that going to get discontinued? Is it not? People writing articles on online, on social media, no one actually knows until it does. So um, people just like to think that, you, you know, you're six months ahead of them, but in reality, no one's ahead of each other. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to disclose specific figures because I feel like that's, um, that's probably not professional, but um, biggest loss. So when I first started selling watches, I had a partner, not a partner, uh, in, in business terms, but just someone that I'd done loads and loads of work with. He was based in London and I was based in Glasgow and we had a really good working relationship. He used to send me stock, I used to send him stock and we'd get sort of stuff on sale or return. So he would send me stuff up without having to pay for it. Um, I would do the same for him. And then uh, we'd done a package deal on a few pieces and basically the watches just never turned up and I lost like 55,000, um, which was like at the time, you know, like two years in, setting up a business is like crippling, totally crippling for a business because that's, bear in mind when you're talking like 2016, 2017, like 55,000 buys you a lot more stuff than it does now. 55,000, you'd be lucky if it buys you two watches now. Whereas back then, you know, that could be seven, eight, nine, ten watches easily. Bear in mind the toners were five, six grand, subs were four grand. Like that was a lot of money and a lot of, a lot of working capital to really take on the chin and lose. Um, Thankfully, I got it back, but two years later, it, that, that's when I got it back. It didn't happen overnight, so that was a humbling experience for the business, for sure. Super difficult because um, you've only got yourself to blame. So 
in a business where you work for yourself and you set it up on your own and you don't have any managers or anyone above you telling you what to do and what not to do, you take all the risks on your own. And um, it is true when people say like no risk, no reward, that's absolutely true, but it comes with responsibility. And when you fuck up, like you need to just take it on the chin. And emotionally, it's super, super difficult because you've got a way of life, you've got bills, you've got everything else still to pay and you lose that massive chunk of money. And at the time, like I wasn't insured, the business didn't have any insurance. So it's effectively gone. And the only thing you can do is just try and get it back. But yeah, emotionally, it's, it's, it takes its toll for sure. I mean, bear in mind, I was like, I would have been uh, 22, 23 maybe. Um, no, is the, is the honest answer. I've been close a few times. Um, but within like the watch industry, a lot of people say like, look, if it doesn't feel right, don't do the deal. And if you get that feeling now, intuition just tells you not to do it because in reality, your margins are sort of between five and 10%. So if you're buying a watch at 10,000, you might make 500 to 1,000 pounds off it. But if it's not, if you feel like there could be a problem with that watch, then don't risk the 10,000 to make 500 quid. Like you'd be better just keeping it and not doing the deal and buying something else that you're sure of. A friend of mine, actually, who I'm really friendly with, who also sells watches from, from Glasgow, got, got stung with one. Um, and it was like perfect. And it was a bit of a story. He kind of caught them at the perfect time. They were like just about to shut the shop. Like they probably weren't as thorough as they should have been with it. Um, the guy just came in. He, it was a Submariner. They, they based, I think they'd paid like five or six grand for it, ended up finding out about a week later that it was fake. Actually not the worst in terms of like, I've heard some really, really, really bad ones. Um, like hundred thousands, hundred and fifty thousands. Um, like if, you, if you're on social media or whatever, you see that um, quite a big dealer in New York sold a little baby, a Platinum 5711 that turned out to be fake and he paid $450,000 for it. So it does happen. It happens a lot in, in America specifically because they diamond set loads of stuff so like Richard Mills, obviously they come in and they'll have like a carbon case or they'll have a titanium case or a gold case. And a lot of the time what they, the, the dealers in America do is they'll take that case and put it to one side, manufacture a new case, diamond set it, and then sell the watch as a diamond set RM11 or RM05, when in reality it's just the strap and the movement. The case isn't, isn't worth anything because it's just an, an aftermarket case. So it happens, quite, it happens a lot more in, in the US than it, than it does in the UK, but yeah, you just need to be super careful. Jewelry's always been a passion of mine. Like, I just feel like it's so much more individual than, than a watch. Like a lot of people just stick to the same watches all the time. So you'll see like Submariners, GMTs, Daytonas, Skydwellers. Like pretty much if you've got a Skydweller, it doesn't matter what color of dial it is, there's another guy going to have one. So like when you work with watches a lot and you see them every day, the novelty of actually having a nice watch sounds stupid, but sort of wears off. So like you get a bit sick of seeing all the same models and, and you don't really have the desire to own any of those specific models because you've seen so many of them, you've sold so many of them. So jewelry, I feel like is a, lo a lot more individual. You can sort of design your own stuff um, and, and you can sort of play about with a lot more in jewelry so you can be a lot more individual, which I really like. So I've like had some stuff made for myself and um, yeah, I think it's, it's a lot better way to sort of for me to express my individuality through jewellery than really f with a watch because in reality, you know, watches does, the ones that I want are half a million quid and I just don't have that money to go and spend on something for myself. So yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that's the whole reason I set up the business to start with. Um, I loved watches, jewellery, um, and the benefit of selling watches is that you get to wear different ones all the time. So. Um, for sure, I mean, I think it's important, especially from a marketing perspective, like there's a lot of watch dealers now that, that just put up a picture of a watch in a box and selling a product, yeah, th those products sell on their own because a Rolex is a Rolex, you're never really going to have to do a massive sale on a Rolex. But if you can show a customer what it's going to look like potentially if they're wearing it or if you wear it with some cool clothes or, you know, like piece it up with some jewellery or whatever, then it obviously makes it a lot more saleable then someone will look at that and go oh that's how it's going to look on me or if I buy that I might look like that or whatever so it's yeah I think for sure it's important 
And any watch dealer that tells you that they don't wear watches that they buy in for customers is lying. Yeah, so when I started doing it, obviously it was a long time ago, so watches were quite taboo. It was more of a luxury purchase. Like people were willing to lose money if they were buying a watch. It wasn't, um, it wasn't like it is now. You know, watches are investments now. People look at them and think, right, if I've got ten thousand in the bank, if I buy a watch, could that be worth eleven thousand next year, and I can get some enjoyment out of wearing it in the meantime? Whereas before, it wasn't like that at all. Um, people were buying watches just to show off, and and were willing to lose money on stuff that they were buying. So it was a lot harder sell back when I started doing it, just because of that. But in terms of getting advice from people, you get really good contacts in the industry and if, if you have a good name and, and you're reputable and you work well with people in the industry, it's easy just to pick the phone up and say, how much do you think that's worth? What can I sell it for? Um, and anyone who tells you they, they don't do that is, is lying as well. But I've got loads and loads and loads of people in my phone who I've worked with over the years that still to this day, like even on basic pieces, because the market moves so quickly and, and in either direction, you just pick up the phone and just get some advice. It's, it's always the best way. You'll find in the last year, all the smaller brands have started to rock it. That's only because stuff became so hard to get with the bigger brands and so expensive. Um, some pieces like have trebled in value. You know, if you're talking about a piece that was 40,000 in 2019, might now be 120. So the affordability of stuff like that in the grand scheme of things has actually went really down. The pool of people that can afford to buy them has went down. So smaller brands have been making a noise. So like FP Jean has like rocketed in the last year. Um, like Vacheron as well, it really rocketed in the last year. But these aren't new watch brands. It's just they never got any attention before because like the big four just swamped the market and no one really gave any of the smaller brands attention. But now that they are equally as investable as the bigger brands, um, definitely they'll be making some noise. Well, they already have done. Nah, nah, it's... it's it's so complex. Um, the problem that you have now, almost similar to like the car market and stuff, is that there's so many brands that have done so much good and came up with so many amazing designs that how are you going to make something that, you know, I want, if I was going to do a watchman, I want to make it that something that I would wear. And it's really, really difficult to create something that that, that you would want to wear and that people that I know would want to wear without, you know, having some big massive brand involved. Um, like Richard Mayo's a prime example, so they've only been going since 2001. Um, which sounds like, doesn't sound like a lot of time, so it's like 20, 21 years or something. Um, their marketing got them to where they are just now, so they had, like Jay-Z's been wearing them since 2001. They then obviously Rafa, um, tennis player, he's obviously been wearing them for years. And their marketing really drove them in a direction that now they're the most expensive watch brand and, and they don't make anywhere near as many watches as any of the other big watch brands make. So they only make, they'll make 5,000 watches a year, Richard Mille. So like that is nothing in comparison to Rolex, AP, like they'll be making millions of watches a year. So um, that's why they are so, so hard to come by and so investable because they don't make any. And the buying process for for RMs is, is really, really stringent. It's, it's similar to Patek, you know, they don't make a lot either, um, but but that's where their drive comes from. So to get into the watch game and, and be manufacturing and then designing is just, it's way too complex for me. To create an NFT or a place on the blockchain for every single watch from now on is only looking after every single watch that's manufactured from the, the first one you put on the blockchain until you stop doing it. So. There's so many before that that you would then need to chase back and, and be, be entering into the blockchain. And I, I just don't see that being something that's transferable into watches. I know cars do it now where they'll sell you like the NFT of the car. But for me, I, I don't really know that much about that NFT side of the market. And I know that loads of people have earned loads of money, but there's also been loads of people that have got stung on the way up. So it's a bit untrustworthy. And I feel like when you're buying an asset like a watch or like in, in some instances, instances cars are assets as well but um, I feel like when you're buying that I, I don't really see them being much use for it unless you know there is some restriction where you're not allowed to sell it and they the manufacturer or the shop then enter it onto the blockchain to prevent you from selling it um, but in terms of creating NFTs of watches it doesn't really appeal to me. I don't really understand it enough to, to say yes or no, but I mean, potentially. 
I think it's important just to be honest. Customers are too worried about not telling the truth. So like if a customer comes to me and says, oh, I've got this watch, how much, how much will you give me for it? And you know, years ago, I, I would know that I would probably be one of two people that they would have contacted, but nowadays it's more like 10 or 15. So often I'll just say, look, do you have a price in mind? If they've got a price in mind, I'll say, have you, have you had any offers before? And if the offer's reasonable that they've had and I can match it, I'll always buy the watch. But um, customers are so caught up in trying to, oh, how much would you pay for it? Or how much would you pay for it? And they don't have a price in mind. And I always say, you can't buy and sell the watch. You need to come to me with a price. If the price is reasonable, I'll buy it every time. But if you're asking for something that's way over the odds, then I'll tell you that. But yeah, a lot, a lot of the time customers are just frightened to tell you what they want. Whereas if a customer just comes and says, look, I've got this, this is how much I want for it. What would you pay for it? It's much, much easier to get a deal done because then you're not working in a gray area where you don't know how much they're expecting. And you're trying to offer a price where you can still make as much money as possible. But every customer's got different expectations and different wealth levels. You know, some guy might walk in to a shop and buy a watch for 10 grand and only want 15, whereas another guy might walk in, buy a watch for 10 and want 25. So um, you, customers just need to come with what they want. And then when they come with what they want, 99 times out of 100, we often get the deal done.